to get started. Um, thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, I think you're going to be um, um, pleasantly surprised. Uh, you're probably excited already, but I think uh, there's going to be uh, two things you're going to, I think, come away with tonight is one, uh, if you have weren't already fascinated with uh, fireflies or lightning bugs, as I, I like to call them from back home, uh, Go ahead and you can put that in the chat if you want to start that conversation. Who's, who calls them fireflies and who calls them lightning bugs? Uh, and um, uh, it's going to be a fascinating presentation. And I think you're going to be a really uh, well-informed and entertained by uh, Sergio. He's, he's a really nice guy and a great presenter. So I think, uh, I think you're going to really enjoy tonight's presentation. So thanks for joining us. Um, and before we get started with Sergio, uh, we're going to just to give you a little bit of information about Sycamore Land Trust in case you're new to, uh, to Sycamore or new to land trusts. Uh, so just let me give you a brief introduction into who we are and what we do. Um, there we go. Um, so um, we're going to record this presentation and you'll be able to find this um, as part of our conservation conversations uh, virtual lecture series. Uh, we've had quite a few uh, really good ones this year. Uh, hopefully you've been uh, able to join some of those. And if you haven't, uh, there's a list of some that we've had and um, there's some really good information out there. So you'll be able to to tune into that uh, and, and check this one out later or some of these other ones we've had. So. Uh, it's been really enjoyable, and we're certainly excited to have Sergio be a part of it. If you're not familiar with where all we work, um, you know, we're based in Bloomington, but we cover uh, all of kind of south central Indiana, about 26 counties uh, spread throughout uh, from, you know, up near Martinsville all the way to Evansville. So you can kind of see the range of our work. Um, you know, kind of focused in the, the Monroe and Brown County region, but we, uh, we have uh, properties kind of all over South Central Indiana. Uh, and that's kind of part of our mission is to preserve the beauty, health, and diversity of Southern Indiana's natural landscapes through strategic and land conservation and environmental education. And uh, I really believe in our mission and uh, keep that in mind every day. Uh, we were out doing that today. So uh, we really appreciate those of you that support us and if you don't we would appreciate your support in helping us achieve that mission um we are uh let's see we're going on uh, 33 years uh as a as an organization we were founded in 1990 uh, we have over 1300 members we have eight full-time staff now uh, we have quite a few interns throughout the year and we have hundreds of amazing volunteers uh, we protect over um 11,000 acres now, which is amazing. Um, and we have 56 uh, nature preserves. Uh, and then we have also conservation easements on some of those properties. Uh, we have 13 public nature preserves where we uh, have trails and you know public access. We have over 30 miles of trails, including a, a beautiful boardwalk, is, which is kind of part of the talk today. Uh, we have free environmental education programs for adults and children and we are accredited with the National uh, Land Trust Alliance. Uh, one of the preserves that Sergio will be talking about and one of our kind of premier preserves is the Bean Blossom Bottoms Nature Preserve, which is over 800 acres now. Um, it has one of the, the longest boardwalks in the Midwest. It is um, a, a, a wetland with many distinctions. Uh, it's uh, dedicated as a, one of the, the Indiana Department of Natural Resources uh, dedicated nature preserves. It's a wetland of distinction by the Society of Wetland Scientists. Uh, National Audubon Society has declared it as uh, an important bird area. Um, and, you know, it's just, it has so many um, um, important features and components, and it is part of our Bean Blossom Creek Conservation Area. Uh, and here's what that encompasses. You know, it um, encompasses uh, the Bean Blossom Creek watershed uh, with a kind of a focus from like the Lake Lemon region to the confluence with the White River. Um, and you can see some of the chunks of land that we've been slowly over the years acquiring and building and growing upon. We've added to that uh, just in the past couple of years uh, significantly and connected some really important components. Um, and we're 
working on restoration on a lot of these properties. In fact, today the stewardship crew was out uh, planting the, the final part of our 15,000 trees at the Sam Shine Foundation Preserve, which is just downstream from Bean Blossom Creek, uh, from, from Bean Blossom Bottoms it, on Bean Blossom Creek. Um, and, you know, one of our focuses um, is providing and protecting habitat for rare, threatened, and endangered species. Um, um, you know, one in particular you've probably heard us talk about is the Kirtland snake. Uh, it's a state endangered species. It's imperiled or endangered in every state in which it occurs. And Indiana is kind of the center of its range. Uh, and it likes wetland habitat. And we found it on quite a few of our preserves in that Bean Blossom Creek conservation area. Uh, and then there's a list of some other state or federally endangered or threatened species that uh, we can find on our preserves and that you, um, that you by supporting us, help us protect land that's important for these species. Uh, and one species that's not listed yet, but could be because it is still pretty rare, is the cypress firefly, which Sergio will tell you a little bit about as part of his talk. Um, and we're going to give you a little bit of background before Sergio talks just about that species in particular, since we're talking about fireflies so much. Um, yeah, I never heard of it, uh, as many of you and uh, many people I talk to that even people that are really into to nature and maybe amateur naturalists uh, don't realize how many different species of fireflies we have. Uh, this cypress firefly um, is very uh, at this point, considered rare because it's not been located in many places. Um, it was discovered by a, a lady, uh, well, two people, kind of, I guess. Uh, Lynn Faust, who lives in uh, Tennessee, discovered it in Mississippi. She was the first person to document the species and, and to get it uh, classified as a new species. Um, and that was in 2017. And then um, Max Henschen, who lives uh, in the Indiana Indianapolis area, um, who has worked with Lynn before. Um, he was scouting some areas that he and Lynn thought potentially they could be. This was really far north from where it was originally discovered. And so, but they thought Indiana had potential because of the link to the Mississippi through the Ohio. And uh, it's, it's a wetland kind of species, uh, it, but it had always been associated with cypress trees, hence the common name cypress fireflies. And we have cypress in the southern part of the state. So they thought potentially this might be the northern limit of the species. So they looked at a couple places and then decided to try bean blossom bottoms, even though we don't have cypress at that particular preserve. Um, and Max felt like he had seen some. Uh, and so he contacted Lynn and said, yeah, I think we have them there. And Lynn wanted to come up and take a look. Um, and ironically, Lynn came up the day before the tornado in 2019, if you guys remember that large tornado that hit the Ellettsville area hit the boardwalk as well. And she came up on the Friday night right before the storm and, um, and let us know that she, she agreed with Max that it was indeed the Cypress Firefly. And then I went out uh, after the, the tornado and, and luckily uh, that area was hit hard, but they were still there and they continue to persist there to this day. So it's a, it's, it's a, a really, for me, it was one of the most magical moments I've had here, going out there and seeing this new firefly that I'd never seen before. Uh, fireflies are magical anyway, but to see something new uh, that, that you know, to me, see, and is considered rare, it was is quite magical. Uh, being out in the wetland at night is, is magical anyway. So, uh, so yeah, that's a little bit about that species. Uh, we hope to have more to tell you about that. We're uh, with Sergio's help, we hope to do some studying on that in, in this preserve and in other places to learn more about it because so little is known about this species. And, you know, there's not a lot known about fireflies in general because there's not a lot of people studying those. And they're a good indicator species, uh, uh, in, insects in general are, but that's one that, that people have some, uh, uh, let's say, some passion about. So that helps maybe fuel the fire to, to conserve these species that are in decline. Uh, and many of our insects, unfortunately, are. Uh, and then um, if, if you followed us, you've heard about our bio blitz last uh, summer, uh, just about a year ago. We had over uh, 70 uh, scientists here, uh, and this was kind of helped uh, organized by the Indian Academy of Science, which Sergio's involved with, and probably talk a little bit about that in his talk tonight. And so we had 70 scientists just volunteering their time come down and, and help us do an intensive survey over a 24-hour period at Bean Blossom Bottoms. Uh, and um, it was amazing. It was such a fun, exciting event. Uh, and we've 
We're just now getting all the results. It's taken a while to go through uh, the samples. Uh, there's a lot of information to go through, a lot of checking on species identification, especially with the insects. Um, and so we're just finally getting the results um, that you guys get the sneak peek since you tuned in tonight. And we looks like the total number of species is over 900, um, just about a thousand, um, and it may end up breaking a thousand. Um, we're still working on final ID, you know, the spiders and beetles and stuff. There's so much that goes into separating species. Uh, so it's a lot of work. And these guys, we're all doing this kind of on as volunteers and they have research or they have teaching positions. So it takes some time, but it was exciting. And it will use this information to help us better manage and protect our preserves. If you want to get more information, there's kind of our contact information, uh, you know, or location address, email or website, we have social media, uh, Kate, Kate does a great job with all that. So there's lots of ways to follow us and find out more about us. And if you're not a member, we'd love to have you become a member and support what all we do. And uh, so here's, let's get into the, the, the exciting part and let's talk about Sergio. Um, uh, I met Sergio uh, because of the Cypress Firefly and uh, I've got to know him because of that connection. Um, and um, and got to meet with him a few times. And he, so um, let me let me read this to you real fast, and so I can get it right. Um, he uh, is works with the uh, he's an invertebrate conservation coordinator for the Global Center for Species Survival at the Indianapolis Zoo, and is the chair of the Conservation Sustainability and Land Management section at the Indiana Academy of Science. Sergio has more than 20 years of experience mobilizing resources to promote invertebrate conservation looking for lost species, and in the summer, he can mostly be found under Indiana's dark skies studying our state's fireflies. He regularly works with a global network of experts, including the IUCN, specialist groups, and the Invertebrate Conservation Committee to tackle understudied threats such as light pollution or illegal wildlife trade using the latest technological tools to reverse the ongoing decline of the most diverse group of organisms on Earth, invertebrates. So, is, there's no better expert to talk to us tonight than on invertebrates, insects, and fireflies in particular. And I'm excited to turn this over to Sergio. He's a great lecturer and uh, uh, enjoy. Thanks, Sergio, for being a part of this. Thank you, Chris. Uh, so I, I will share my screen as well because I, I made a PowerPoint as all academics do. It's almost part of the thing. Let's see how it works. Should be good. Sorry, here we go. And I need to do this. Oh, sorry, I started. Okay, so so thank you, Chris, of course, for the introduction. That that was very lengthy, and uh, and uh, I, I do less. I mean, I do a lot of stuff, but uh, in overall, I, I'm just a, a kid who likes bugs that never really grew out of it. That's all I've done. And the, the chance that I've got to do it like academic and got to study it and got to do it as a job is just uh, surreal to me to this day. So that's really all I am at a nutshell. What I get to do with it, which, which has become my role, is to try and protect the things that I see and I care about because as Chris mentioned, and I'll mention a little, they have been disappearing and they haven't been doing great. So I'll talk about the wild lights of being blossom. So the summary that I have for these next 30 minutes or so, I'll talk about wild lights and what I mean by them and what's the known unknowns of our humble state insect. I'll talk about firefly ghosts and what ghosts are in my field. I'll talk about the Department of Natural Resources swap and that process for 2023 and 2033 and how entomologists and people like yourselves should be involved and what everyone here can do to help. So without no further ado, here, here it goes. So Chris started very timely to talk about fireflies and lightning bugs. This is what the latest research has to do, at least from my Google search online. These are the states in the US who call uh, fireflies fireflies. Those are the states who call it lightning bugs. Somewhere in the middle, fireflies have been becoming increasingly popular with younger Americans, and they've been encroaching on what is lightning bugs territory in recent years. New York is in a particular uh, area where it disagrees with itself because Manhattan seems to prefer fireflies, but Staten Island says lightning bugs. I would be curious to see what you call it here and how that develops with the year. But this is what the current Google science has to say about that. Uh, so what I call wild lights are animals like this. This probably looks nothing like what you expect to be a firefly. This is a male 
uh, fangodidae, or what people call glowworms, and the males do not look like a worm at all, and they do not glow. But they have huge antennae, which are like the main distinctive uh, feature. And this is what a female looks like of a railroad uh, worm. And the, the animal, the railroad, is actually the one with the orange dots. That's the glowworm. The other one is a millipede, which is a different type of arthropod, and they feed on millipedes. Millipedes are incredibly toxic. Sometimes they call it cherry uh, bugs or because they smell like cherry. That's because they have in themselves, they're producing toxic chemicals that resemble almonds or cherries, which are also quite toxic, by the way, when eaten green. And so it feeds on these animals and it is itself quite toxic. And this is how they look like when, when they are annoyed in the dark, shiny. So they do that to attract, of course, mates, uh, the female to announce where they are. And that's what they do to uh, uh, tell predators how toxic they are, even in the dark. And they're found right here in Indiana. And I've got the chance to see a few of them uh, in our dark skies, as I like to see. So these are some of our wild lights. The other thing that I mean by wild lights is, of course, something like this. So if you're lucky in a summer night, you'll see a flash followed by nothing, and then another flash, nothing, and then it appears somewhere else in this kind of ghostly fashion, and then another, and then nothing, and then it reappears again. This kind of run, we call it, is when one male is in complete darkness, no male will be brave enough to be the first one to come out until one will, and the others will follow. So these kind of behaviors is quite unique to insects here, and this is what most people recognize as the flashing firefly. So they glow as they fly. And in scientific terms, this is a, a summary of a tree of life. And you got on your left, you know, worms and, uh, and then, you know, millipedes and other things. So people call it fireflies, they're not flies. Flies are a different kind of insect. They have two wings. That's not what uh, fireflies are. People call them lightning bugs. They do not produce lightning. That's not how they produce light. And they're not bugs. Bugs, uh, sorry. Low, uh, bugs are a different kind of insect. They're not glowworms. Worms are a different kind of invert, not even insects. They're annelida. So not bugs, not flies, and not worms. What they are is beetles, pretty much like ladybirds and many others. It's a very big group. Uh, you get a few, I talked about millipedes before. I, I put myriapods here so that you can see where they sit. They're arthropods. They sit in these groups of animals with exoskeletons, animals with articulated legs, which is what arthropod means. Our pod being um, Latin or Greek, I believe, for, for legs. So pod and arthropod means articulated legs. So it includes, of course, millipedes, centipedes, crustaceans like roly polies, calicerates like the arachnids, like spiders and scorpions and so on. And of course, many, many insects, butterflies, fireflies, dragonflies, and fireflies are beetles. We, in fact, are fish. That's what humans are. That's what all vertebrates are. We're all fish. If you don't think that's weird. If you don't believe that too much, you should read a book called Our Inner Fish, and that will show you why humans are just weird fish who left the water. But in effect, vertebrates are all a group of weird fish. And yeah, and you have snails as well. Snails are not arthropods. They are invertebrates. And I put snails here so you can see because snails is actually the food source of fireflies. Because, you know, this kind of story isn't important, but I'll talk a little bit about the life cycle so you get some biology out of it. So evolutionary wise, uh, fireflies are the family Lampiridae, that's the one in the bottom of your screen, and railroad uh, worms are Fengudidae, so they're both beetles, different families, and there's a few ones, but they're tropical, so you wouldn't find them here. We do have Elateridae, that's the one in purple, and some of them will glow, they're called click beetles, but the ones we have here do not glow, only tropical Elateridae will glow. So the development of glowing uh, fireflies or glowing beetles developed in the Jurassic, that's a stegosaurus for you to see where the Jurassic was quite a while ago. That was the first animals to see a firefly glow were some dinosaurs. They were the first ones to notice it, I would assume. And, and they, of course, continue to glow to this day. They are magical for many reasons, because they fly. Flying is already amazing in itself, and they glow when they fly, which is extra amazing. Bioluminescence, or producing light, is quite fairly common in the marine realm not common at all in a terrestrial realm. There's a longer story to tell there of why that is, but very few animals glow in terrestrial environments. So fireflies stand out as this remarkable group. And they've been with us through the Cretaceous Paleogene until this day. We've lost some, sadly, but with your help and maybe continuing to work, we'll have them for future generations to enjoy and appreciate. So let's go to the life cycle, which is what most people uh, like or want to know. So this is confusing, so I'll try to kind of make it shorter and clearer. Fireflies glow, they produce light, 
to communicate to each other. It's a defense mechanism at heart. So it's used by their baby, their larva to tell predators, I can't be eaten, or if you eat me, you're gonna regret it. Um, but they use it as adults. They flash when they you know, fly to announce to each other, and sometimes to other males, who they are and that they are available. So it's the male display. It is similar in many ways to a bird song. Fireflies don't produce sound, their song is light. So their love song is made of light. And once they find the right partner, they will, of course will mate, they will lay eggs. This is by the way, the Genji firefly from Japan, but the life cycle has a lot of similarities with many of our Indiana fireflies. Males will usually have more lanterns. That's the information on the top right. Uh, that means that they usually emit more light. They usually are the ones announcing their vigor, where they are, how that they are the right ones. Female can have lights and can respond to that, but sometimes they have a lesser a lanterns. This is not always the case. Some fireflies don't flash at all, winter fireflies being an example of that. But anyway, that's not the ones I'll focus today. They'll lay eggs. The babies, like I mentioned, are small larvae. You have a picture of one in the bottom left, and they very often feed on snails. That's one of the main diets. So if one is looking to protect fireflies in their homes, in their backyards, in a natural protected area, like in bean blossom bottoms, uh, protecting snails is often the way to go. Without prey, without snails, there won't be any fireflies. They can eat slugs, some will eat worms, but these are, you know, it depends on the species, of course. And this is just broadly, I didn't want to go into much details, but this is the Genji firefly in a nutshell, or the life cycle of most fireflies. Uh, an interesting thing about the Genji firefly, and the reason I picked this one, is because it's a bit of a national symbol in Japan. It's quite worshipped, it's venerated, it's protected, and it's quite well studied as well, just as that. And many animals are national symbols. You, you know this, right? Russia has the bear, the US would have, let's say, the bald eagle. Uh, Mexico, interestingly, you might not know, has this fenarium grasshoppers, which is a dish, is a delicacy, and it's fried and eaten. Um, Sri Lanka, for example, has a butterfly, which is Troides darcius. And even though the US animal is mostly the, the bald eagle, there's an US has a particular thing that many or very few countries don't have, which is state birds and state plants and things like that. So the US, as you may know, each state has their state bird. The state bird of Indiana is the cardinal, which is not very original, I would say. Many states have the cardinal. We should work on that. Not an ornithologist, just putting it out there. And of course, on the right, you have a map of state flowers. So you can get some, by the way, the flower of Indiana, it's a peonies, I believe, not a native flower, just saying we should work on that as well. However, these are just things to work on for those here who, when we looked at the state insects of the US, these are just a broad map. And interestingly, if you look at the red circles, these are all honeybees, the European, Honeybees. They're great insects. I love honey, not, not dismissing that, but that's too many of a non-native insect. So we're doing, we are not doing it right as well, but I get it. We all love honey, but I have several good suggestions to replace those. If anyone ever knows a government that wants uh, suggestions, I'll be there. And these three here that I highlighted now are ladybugs, the European ladybugs. They're also great, but also not native. I have quite a few suggestions. But just the just last example, this is a European praying mantis. Also uh, not the best example, I would say. But anyway, I have suggestions. If anyone asks, let me give them a ring. I, can, I have ideas. But there is one state, which is Pennsylvania, whose state insect is the Photurus pennsylvanica. So that's a firefly. And you know, Pennsylvania, the firefly is called from Pennsylvania. Great choice, works perfectly. I have no criticism there. Uh, Tennessee, uh, as Chris mentioned, is the land of Lynn Faust. I'll mention her later as well. It's well known for its great smoky mountains, the beautiful synchronous firefly. That's Photinus carolinus. So surely that would be their species of choice. They did great. They didn't. They chose Photinus carolinus. That's the common big dipper. That's the most common species of firefly in the eastern US. So they had a chance to pick a great species and they failed. I don't know how this happened. I don't know who failed here. If they want some revisions, I'll be happy to assist, but they should have picked another firefly. Nothing wrong with this one, by the way, but just saying, they had options. And lastly, the last state to have a firefly is Indiana. And Indiana has Piracnomena angulata. So that's the angled candle firefly or commonly known as Say's firefly. So the, the well, Chris mentioned my introduction, 
The Indianapolis Zoo has the global center for species survival. We are based in Indiana. There's a big team. I'm just the invertebrate coordinator. So of course I was interested in fireflies and learning more about this insect since I've come. But we also have a mammal coordinator, that's Justin. We have a freshwater coordinator, that's Moni. Plants and fungi coordinator, that's Katia. A PR person, that's Kelly, who helped uh, share this talk. Uh, Sammy Vande, he's our bird coordinator. Laura Perry is our behavioral change coordinator. So she, changed, she works with human dimensions of conservation and Bill Street, who's our director. And so when we, when the center was created and it's based here in Indiana, of course, I got interested in the Indiana state insect. The t-shirt I'm wearing now uh, was purposely wear to show you the state insect uh, t-shirt that I got at a bug fest. I participated. I didn't get it. I buy it, but I got it at a festival that I made uh, last year, Bugfest. So we are based in Indiana, so I'm interested in this insect. So as any normal person would do, I looked into it. And here is the story that I found. So in 2000, so five years ago to this day, 2018, a student at Cumberland Elementary, that's Kyla's shoe on the right. She was looking at a book with her professor, Maggie Samudio, and the book was about US states. And so it's talking about, and I have here, and the book is you know, the United States of America state by state guide. And they went to Indiana and you have like the state bird, the state flower. And she asked a very simple question. Every good idea starts with a good question. She asked her professor, why doesn't Indiana have a state insect? That was the question. And the teacher said, there's, I don't know, there's I don't know, no good reason. Like any honest teacher would say, I don't know is a great answer. And that's what Maggie Samudio said. So it so happens that there is a very famous Hoosier, and that's Thomas Say, that's him on the right. Thomas Say lived about 200 years ago. He was a famous zoologist, described many species. One of such species was what he called Paraclomena angulata, or what is now called Say's firefly, it's his firefly. So when they were looking at species that had a state connection, they thought, this is a great one. Let's have someone that honors you know, a person from our state. I have more details on this, but I don't think we need to to go there, but they thought this was a good idea. And I, I agree, I think it's a great idea. So like any other normal school children did, they wrote letters, many, many letters to asking to support the petition to elect this as a state insect. And as very good students did, they went on the steps of the state house and advocated for this to become the state insect. They contact, they did all the right things. And from a very, I would say a stroke of luck, doing the right things rarely leads to the right reaction, but in this case it did. And in 2018, they made the proposal, that's their names from the room 23 of Cumberland Elementary, that's the name of the students. And here it is, in 2018, it was signed officially as a state insect and this is how the state, and even though I was across the ocean, I was in London at the time working there, I heard this call, I heard this story and I knew it happened. And that was part of the driver that I came here. And it's inspiring. And I think you, you all, any Hoosier should be proud of what happened. Cause I think it's a story of thriving and persevering and succeeding in the end to protect the thing that many people would dismiss and the students didn't. And I think that's great. Um, so let's talk about the SAIS Firefly. So I came here, first thing I asked, so what do we know about the SAIS firefly? This is at stake, five years have passed. Surely this is the best place in the world to study fireflies, surely. So I wanted to know, you know the known unknowns, what was known about uh, this species. How is, the state, how is the state firefly doing in its home state of Indiana? So I did what you know, people do in my position. So I did some research. I looked at the literature and it took me quite a lot of time to find a single record. So for a while, I thought that the state insect of Indiana wasn't recorded in Indiana at all, because I found nothing. I tried and tried and no record in the literature. Then I did the next logical thing. I went to museums collection, like the Purdue Ethnological Research Collection and look at specimens there. Because it turns out Thomas Say did not describe this species from Indiana. He did move here at the end of his life, he died here, but he collected the specimen in another state. So as far as he knew, the species could easily not even exist here. This is not where he saw it first. Uh, so I talked to the state stakeholders, that's of course DNR in this case, Indiana heritage data. I talked to expert knowledge. Uh, Chris already mentioned Lynn Faust who described the Cypress firefly, spoke to her. Sarah Lewis uh, is a chair of the firefly, a specialist group. She wrote this book, uh, which you won't be able to see, which is Silent, uh, Silent Sparks, really good book uh, about firefly behavior. Chris Worth of Coastal Purdue, Kyle Schnepp, so all these experts, and I got some information from, have you seen this in, in Indiana? 
And lastly, I contacted uh, local knowledge of people who live here and like fireflies. Chris already mentioned Max Henschen. He's one of the people I got in touch. Amelia Wilderman, Marcia Everhart, Katie Meyer, Laurie Hughes, Linda Romain, and Frank Ott. And I got in touch to learn, have you seen it and where? And of course, I used the online platforms. I'm not that old. So I went online and tried to find uh, what was known. And this is what I found out. Here's the summary. So in 1910, Blatchley said of the angle of the Sace firefly, it is frequent in Indiana, one of our most common fireflies. Sadly, this is over 100 years ago, mind you, but sadly, he didn't share any records. He had so many that he shared none. I had to go to his collection. That's how I got the data. I had to go through the specimens and just copy the data myself because he thought this is common. It's doing great. No need to worry. That's what he thought. And then Walcott in 1933 in Montgomery found it here in the swamp area. It now seems, well, at the time they were already sharing concerns about it disappearing. So that's probably not where it is now. So I had to wait quite a long time. And then 1940, another record. And then in 1957, Lloyd summarized Green's reports and this is where it was seen in Indiana. That's its flashing pattern, by the way. I'm trying to simulate how the animal flashes in real life. And this is Lloyd in 2018, just before he passed away, he put some more data in the map and that's it. And finally in 2017, this is where. So according to the literature, for a species that's common, this is where it was found. If the cardinal, the state bird, was seen only in these places, mostly in the 20s, we would be concerned. I thought, I would think we should, if, if this was a cardinal, but because it's an insect, we have failed to even think about it. How is our state insect doing? So I looked into the museums, I mentioned this, and this is some of the data that I added from those museums. Again, I didn't mention the dates here, but they're all from the 60s, 50s, some earlier than that. So it hasn't, in, in the last 23 years, so in this century, it was seen once, publication-wise, and even collection-wise, very few records. But one from Turkey run, um, very few. And mind you, this was a species that 100 years ago was considered one of the most common fireflies. And now we barely get one record a decade or one every 20 years. So fortunately, the scenery, is, the scenery is not that bleak, it's just mostly lack of studies. Some of the people who live here have seen it and I have added to this map. I haven't um, got to summarize it yet, but there's a few more records, but it's clearly not common. This is what I call the tragedy of the common. When something is assumed to be so prevalent that we stop studying or care, and then when we notice we might've lost 20, 30, 50%, of that species and we didn't even notice it was gone. The species might have gone extinct from the entire state, extirpated completely in this area and we wouldn't have noticed, nobody was looking. And I think it's too valuable, too small for us to care, sure, but too valuable for us to lose in my opinion. So that, that's what I was doing. So these are the people from the museum who kindly uh, share their data. And it's thanks to them that I actually have the map that I showed you now and I hope to publish uh, soon. Uh, Luciano Musetti, of course, that's in Ohio, and Christopher in Illinois, Eric in Kentucky. So I basically reached out to everyone in the states of the Midwest, and I annoyed a lot of people. That's what I'm really good at, to be honest. I'm good at finding animals in nature and annoying people. That's like my two nature, natural gifts. And as I didn't want to stop there. My, my mind doesn't work that way. So I thought, this is a state firefly. How are the other fireflies doing in Indiana? So what fireflies occur? We, didn't, we don't have a catalog yet. I'm writing the catalog now. We don't know how many species we have in the state. Where and when were they seen? How long has it been since the last time this species was seen in the entire state? So I was interested in that. Are they still there in this day? So they were seen 100 years ago, 50 years ago. Are they there today? Uh, and what species within that? So I want to, basically the end question is how many are threatened? How many should we be? prioritizing for conservation and taking action to ensure they're here for generations to come. So a lot of that work came down to Jim Lloyd. I mentioned him a little briefly. So he, he came to Indiana, he came to Perk. He was the first one to give the steps towards a catalog, but sadly he passed away before completing that work. And I'm now trying to take his legacy and carry that on. And Lynn Faust wrote this other book, which is Fireflies, Gold Worms and Lightning Bugs. And she wrote the, the guide for North America. It's one of the best books ever written on the topic. And she, of course, is, has been a great help. She was the one supporting me to find the right community and she herself has provided data. So at the moment, my summary for now is, and this is still a work in progress, but to give you a glimpse, we have, I believe, 44 species of fireflies and glowworms in Indiana. We have one plutomus, seven pyracnomena, this is species, seven species within that genus, two lucidota, two elicia, and on and on. 
The most diverse being it appears to be Photinus with 14 species and Photurus with nine. And I have Alicia there with two, but in fact, we have kind of three and they're now Photinus. So the number is growing just as I speak to you now and as I revise what I have just written a few hours ago. So the number is probably 45 and it's growing. And there's some species that were reported but might sadly no longer be here. So we will see. Uh, I wanna talk about ghosts a little. And ghosts, usually in taxonomy, means an animal that hasn't been seen in a long time. We know it exists, but all we have is its ghost, is its record. The animal itself is sadly gone, or we don't know if it's still there. But in fireflies, this has a double uh, meaning because there are the true ghost, which is a spirit, uh, which is a, a genus, the name of a genus of firefly. So this is a picture by Spencer Black from Black Studios, one of the best uh, picture I've seen of the blue ghosts, and we have blue ghosts uh, here in Indiana. So let me tell you a little bit about ghost fireflies. So ghost fireflies, for those who are not impressed, you should. The image on the, on the left is a flying male caught in flight. On the right, you can see how tiny they are. They are the size of a grain of rice. This is the creature who produced those blue glows I've showed you earlier. That's how small they are. Um, and yeah, Abbott Nature made one of the best pictures of them in flight that I've ever seen anywhere. Uh, and they're amazing and they're really beautiful, but in Indiana, that's the one on the left, that's the blue ghost. That's the one I was sharing the photo and the body is only found in one locality, only one place. So when thinking about conservation, if you wanna keep it in Indiana, if you wanna people from Indiana to see it and have it, we should really protect that site and others around it. So that's part of the work I've been doing to support. We have another ghost, which is called the shadow ghost. And shadow ghost is an interesting one because this is a male, this is the, door, the ventral, so it's belly. And if you notice, it's just, the, the belly is just black. It has no lanterns. The males don't flash, the females do. The females call the males. They have giant eyes, which you can see in the picture. They're so big, they almost touch each other and stumble each other, how big they are, to detect that little glow. And the males don't glow at all, and they just glow to the females. And they were only found in one spot, and they haven't been seen at least since 1910, so in over a century, and only one spot. So again, not saying that's the only place they exist, that's the only record we have. So again, if you want to protect them and have them in the state, we should really look at them. And that's something I'm doing this year as well. That's what I do in my firefly season. And lastly, we have the luminous ghost. And this is an interesting one because the specimen is the, this is the only record east of the Mississippi River. So it's not impossible, but there's a chance this is actually a unique species. And this is the only place in the world this unique species exists. So I'm definitely keeping an eye on that. And I have a question mark there because we don't even know how it glows. Nowhere in its range. It's so rarely seen that people don't know what color its glow is, if it glows or not. We assume it glows because it has lanterns, but we don't know what color, how. Um, I assume it's somewhat similar to the blue ghost in some ways, but maybe not as green blue, maybe more yellow, but that's just an assumption based on you know, other species. And the specimen that exists is a museum specimen. It wasn't ever published, but it was you know, mentioned. And it's from 1967. Wasn't recorded before, wasn't recorded since. And again, it's one of the species I'm focusing my summers. That's why I spend, time under dark skies uh, in summer. All right, so the reason why we have so few fireflies, or one of the reasons, could be light pollution. So if you look at the, the map, it shows, well, it has like a, a color uh, change and the red colors are light pollution. You can see Chicago to the top left-ish and Chicago is very red, right? You can see Indianapolis, it's already a spot, of course. And I put the map like that. Let me show you where Indiana is so you have a better perspective. I think this will help. So Chicago is really, well, Indianapolis. If you look at the corners of West Virginia, you have some proper dark skies there. That can give you an idea of how non-darkness we have in Indiana. We have none. There are a bit of darkness, which is moderate darkness, close to Lafayette, just west of Lafayette, but it's all agricultural fields. So habitat, even the streams that are, I've, I've looked, even the streams, they don't have a lot of vegetation. Fireflies would like it if they have the habitat, if they have the food, if they have the habitat to live there. So they could live there, but they don't. And if you look at uh, the only darker patch, that's that's where um, bean blossom is really. That's the southwest uh, and a bit, that's the Hoosier National Forest. And that's where some of our most rare fireflies exist because that's the only place they can. And for fireflies it's interesting because I said the light is their love song. They're singing with light. They don't sing with noise, they sing with light. If you try to put light on that behavior, it's similar for you trying to whisper to your loved one how much you care about them in the middle of a heavy metal concert. 
that's the kind of vibe you're going for. So they, they, it's very difficult for them to do what they do. Uh, so there's a project called the Lights Out Indie, uh, which of course focuses on bird, but I hope to continue to, you know, encourage them to focus on other animals that just try to reduce light pollution. So when I mention what people can do in their everyday life, that's super easy and will save you money and help the environment and help fireflies is turning your light off. If you can't turn it off, maybe put like those timers where it goes off at just, you know, when you're not using it anyway. And if you can't do that, maybe consider filters. That is instead of having white light, trying to in a safe manner that doesn't cause a fire, please just make that light be not white, maybe be red. Red could be a better way to affect, affect fireflies less or blue, but red is a good color. So, so these are some of the things that I've been trying to convey. That was my expert advice, let's say to DNR. That's something that other biologists did not mention because they're focused on very important topics like you know, habitat destruction, like you know, infrastructure being built and cutting through habitat, deforestation, well, and pollution in the water. And nobody mentioned light pollution. So I was the one raising my hand and saying, have you thought about light pollution when thinking of a strategy for the next 10 years of conservation. So this leads me to this uh, very handsome gentleman here on the right, that's Chris Fox, and to Bean Blossom. So he mentioned this a little. So the Sais firefly is considered vulnerable in the red list, so it's a threatened species by the global ICN red list. And the map in the middle are all the dots where it's found, right? And if you notice, Bean Blossom is quite far north from any other dot that it's ever been recorded. It's not just a little bit north, it's quite far north. And it's quite unique in its habitat. The reason why that's such a valuable point to me is because when you think about climate resilient, animals surviving and thriving after climate change, which we don't seem to be able to stop, so it's coming. So we might as well help animals thrive when it does come and people, of course, uh, the northernmost edge of species range is where we wanna invest funds. Because if the north of the range becomes stopped, it's a block, animals can't move northern than that. They stop there. And that becomes their only point of range, if that makes sense. So I'm thinking about keeping bean blossoms as healthy as it can be, support it in any way I can, so that the species can, in time, as climate changes, it becomes warmer, the species can migrate north. And that's a central point. It's a choking point, in a way, to its migration north or its movement north. So connectivity is important. And having an ability to thrive in those northern most points is very important. So connectivity with the ones just south of it, and of course, thinking in the future for it to move north. I'll talk about that in a moment. But as I, as I do, I wanted to show you how that flash looks. Chris showed a picture from the article. This is again, this is from Radin Schreiber from Radin Photo, one of the best firefly photographers out there. And this is his photo from Illinois, I believe, of the um, Cypress firefly. It's quite unique where it has dot, 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 and then a glow. So it leaves that trail in the end. And here you have, uh, and it lives in swamps. Uh, Chris already mentioned that. So this is kind of how it looks in nature. There's a video by Radim uh, on YouTube, which you, I didn't want to play it here, but you can easily find it and it's worth seeing. So you get an idea of what, mag how magical and different this firefly is from anywhere, anything else you might see anywhere in the world. So people have noticed this firefly before. So here's, this is Richard Joyce, he's from Xerxes. Grace Lovett is a student from Tufts University. She's supervised by Michael Reed and in part by Sarah Lewis, the person from the book. She's the chair of the firefly specialist group. And, and they were looking, Grace was looking for her um, academic work to look using Maxent and modeling the species. So she was trying to understand, this is where we know the animal is. If I put a computer model in it, where the similar conditions exist. So the species might probably occur there. The model basically gives us a probability. It's 90% likely to exist there, 50% likely. It kind of looks at the conditions where a species does exist and predicts where it might exist. So really useful stuff. And I talked to her because I was interested in what she was feeding the model, what information she was telling the model that the species likes. And of course, being close to swamp wetlands was a huge part of it because that's the only places it has been found so far. Chris mentioned that a little as well. So I'll tell you something interesting now about Indiana. So in the 1820s, if you look at a map of Indiana habitats, you'll notice that close to what is now Kankakee Sands, there was a wetland, a massive wetland that's in the north uh, west of the state. In 2001, when we do a map, that's not at all what it looks like. And you, you know this, if you live in Indiana, if you travel at all, you'll notice this wetlands are declining, you know, they're very, very low. I was interested in this because it's not only the case of Indiana, Illinois is the same thing. There's the swamp, the wetlands you see there were across the border, of course, to Illinois. It doesn't stop at the border, it continued. 
and people maybe you've heard of this ohio had something that they call it the the first column call it the black swamp i believe so it's been a it's, it was a well-known atlanta that was of course now drained but ohio and you can see a tip of it let's say at the east side of indiana northeast you can see a little bit of that wetland it went on to ohio so a lot of wetlands in that area that are now completely gone i'll mention uh, this is an important bit of information i'll tell you why when I say that I appreciate fireflies and you do and everything, we're not the first ones, the first humans to recognize the beauty of fireflies. The land we are on, Indiana is the land of the Indians. In this tribe, the people that, uh, you know, the legacy we have, the fireflies we see are here because of the legacy of the Miyamiaki nation, the Lenape, the Bodwami, the Sanwa, the Kaskaya, and the Kikapoi, and many others. These are the indigenous people of Indiana who protected these environments for us to have what we have today. The reason I can taste pawpaws in August is thanks to their stewardship for the land. All we have to do is not to mess up what they left us to, to care for. And the reason it's so important, I'll, I'll mention a brief story. So in the left, you have an image of a firefly. And that's a drawing from a book called The Place of the Miyamiyaki. Uh, and that's Earth and Sky, it's a, it's a book written by, and the artist by Julie Olds. And she speaks, that she made this story for a, a story called Wawa Samwa Nelhi Kilswa. So the firefly and the moon, it's called, where Wawa Samwa is the firefly. I was very interested in this story. It's a beautiful story that you know narrates the behavior of the firefly glowing at night and the moon. But the interesting thing, the thing that spiked my interest is that Lynn Faust described this species, the cypress firefly, in 2018 or 2017, so really recent. It was unknown to science. It had never been described by scientists. However, indigenous people, the Miyamiaki people, call fireflies, all fireflies, they call it wa, wa, some, wa. That's the exact flash pattern of the cypress firefly. Flash, flash, glow, flash, wa, wa, some, wa. That's exactly what the firefly does. So I have the impression that something I wanted to work with the Miami Nation is their range, the Miami Nation's nation, included the north of Indiana, included Illinois, included Ohio, and they called all fireflies this. So if I'm correct that this is their name for this species of firefly, it's because it was so common when they were the stewards of the land that they thought this was the most common firefly. And as those wetlands were gone, so was the firefly, but in their language, the memory of the firefly remained. So my premise is that maybe as we think about recovering or working on conserving Cypress firefly, those wetlands I showed you earlier in the north of the state, maybe that's part of the home range of the Cypress firefly. And we would do very well to work with indigenous nations to learn more about that and maybe involve them in recovering those wetlands and probably spread the Cypress firefly further north to what it was its original natural range. But anyway, that's just part of the work that I've done and part of the reason why I was so passionate, or I am so passionate working with Chris and Sycamore on trying to understand more about the Cypress Firefly. But the reason we do this ultimately is because of future generations. We want to leave them with a better world than the one we found. And they've already actually taken the first step for us. This is the children when the, Cyper when the state insect became says Firefly. This is them celebrating the day of the signature. So it's for them that we, it's for their future, for my daughter's future, your sons and daughters' future, that we should protect these animals so that they can enjoy it as well and protect the legacies of those who came before us. So in the immortal words of Dylan Thomas, the Welsh poet, uh, do not go gentle into that good night. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. Don't allow fireflies to be gone in the state. Don't, don't, let it, don't let it be acceptable. It shouldn't be acceptable. Rage is an appropriate reaction in this case. And, and that's it from me. I think I might've exceeded my time, but that's all I had to say. Excellent. Thanks, Sergio. That that was fascinating. Um, um, I if anyone had, I, I probably didn't mention this in the beginning, but if anyone has any questions, um, feel free to throw that in the chat now. Um, or if if you really uh, feel uh, inspired to just unmute yourself and ask it yourself, uh, we'd be happy to have you join the conversation. This is supposed to be a conversation. So if you'd like to just jump in, uh, do that. If not, you type it in a chat. I'll happy to read it to Sergio and, and give it an answer. Um, um, Sergio, I, I'll, I'll start I'll start the going, you know, I'll put the tip in the tip jar and get it going here. Um, 
Uh, well, one question, since you ended on the Cypress Firefly, um, and, and really fascinating the, the the link to the indigenous people. Um, if if you're right, and it was further north, um, there there weren't cypress trees there. So what? And it's named the Cypress Firefly. You know, you and I have had this conversation, but share it with the rest of the group. Um, maybe it's not. Maybe it doesn't need cypress trees. And um, so so what can you what can you say to that that part? Yeah, that, 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 about the conversation we've had a little. So as Chris pointed out a little, its existence in, in Bean Blossom Bottom is quite a special one for many reasons. Being the northmost record is one, but it also was a record that wasn't included in the original publication or naming. So when the species was originally named, it was only known from Cypress Swamps. That was the only place it had ever been seen. Since then, it was seen in other places, including Bean Blossom Bottom that doesn't have that many cypress, a little in the south, as Chris has mentioned, but not throughout. It's not by ecological definition, a cypress swamp. Um, the reason why that matters, of course, is that when you look at wetlands, you, it doesn't have to have cypress or thrive in cypress because the firefly is not a plant eater. It doesn't feed on the cypress. It feeds on snails and other, well, as far as we know, right? This is a generalistic view. Maybe the animal eats like, you know, little worms or little slugs, who knows? but most of them are predators, definitely not cypress eaters. So the dependency of it and the cypress is not necessarily a strict one, meaning we wouldn't have to recover cypress swamps or forest necessarily for it to thrive. It's possible that there's a connection in the sense that where cypress trees thrive, those conditions, those wetland, that kind of swampy area is the same one where the cypress firefly prey also thrive. That's why there's been this correlation. What probably happened, or uh, my theory now has been, that it disappeared as the wetland disappeared, and these were the only places where it managed to hang on. So what we see today, the reason it was only described so recently, relatively recently, like 2017 is not that long ago, is because its range was diminished a lot. Like as the wetlands declined, so did the firefly. And so it becomes incumbent upon people like me or upon us to try and recover that habitat and allow it connectivity to do so, because there's no point in protecting wetlands, let's say, in Kankakee Sands, if we were to do something like that. But from bean blossoms there is quite far. If you try and drive it, you'll see how far it is. For a tiny firefly, it's very difficult to get there. So connectivity becomes the issue. And it doesn't, like Chris said, it doesn't have to be with cypress. Whatever natural vegetation is you know, native to that sort of habitat, the firefly should, in principle, as it does in bean blossom, should thrive. Excellent. We're all about connectivity. That's why that's why we focus so much on being lost in freak areas, connecting those dots. So excellent. Um, we have a couple questions. So let me go to those. Uh, one from Elaine. Are there years where one might see more or fewer lightning bugs? And seen some years I see many, and then a couple of years were very few. Yeah. So so the yeah, it, it's very depending on species and the habitat. The species that thrives the most here in Indiana and many of the eastern states is the Photinos uh, pyralis, the one I kind of mentioned in the, as a state insect of Tennessee, and that's the Big Dipper. So its flash is quite easy to distinguish, quite unique in itself. It has a J shape, so it doesn't flash, it glows. It has a So it's a continuous flash. It flashes around uh, the you know hip height, let's say, so fairly low flying animal. And the reason we see more of it, and this goes to the answer specifically, is that that firefly, usually flashes naturally around sunset. So it's a twilight species. So it tolerates light, which means it doesn't get as disturbed by you know, lamps and stuff. So people get to see it more. So in a year where you happen to have you know, the right humidity, your lawn, you didn't pick up the leaves maybe, or you left the no, how they call it, the no mow May, you know, and you don't mow your lawn for May. So you did some things there and those fireflies thrive and they do well. If the next year or a couple of years, it doesn't rain as much, humidity is not that great for the species, you picked up all your leaves, you mowed your lawn earlier than maybe uh, I would have liked to personally, and you cut all the things, maybe they were there, but you just eliminated them before they even come out. So those kind of behavior, people's behaviors, I mean, human behavior on your property, on your lawn, on your leaves, that's enough to make a dent in these populations. They might come back if you again, leave your leaves, at least until Mother's Day, I usually say, leave your leaves on the ground until Mother's Day. And in, in May, try to not mow your lawn. I know your labor, neighbors might not like it. Put a little sign explaining why. There's a lot of firefly signs and pollinator signs. Tell them why you don't want to mow your lawn. 
And those kind of behaviors might impact firefly numbers. Yeah, in your property. Okay. Good. Um, uh, Bill has a question. It says, on your chart, fireflies found in Indiana, um, are your overall Indiana Fotura species numbers low due to them being difficult to identify? And a uh, second part is, what is your approach to identifying Fotura species? What a great question. So the first answer is yes. The Photurus is quite a difficult group to get right. And that's the group of the Cypress Firefly, by the way. They're just fairly easy because of their flash pattern. And that's really the second part of the answer. Flashing pattern is the best way to go about identifying Photurus. So they all, so they all look kind of alike morphologically. They all look different as well, but the differences in a single species overlap with the differences between species. So you'll see these different morphologies and different patterns, but you can't make sense of them. Fireflies aren't confused. They know very well what they are doing. We're the ones confused about what they're doing and trying to tell us. So the best way to identify photurus is definitely by pattern. I would say though, photurus are a special group of animals because the female photurus, uh, they will of course try to communicate with the males and mate. They do something else as well. So female photurus are called female fatale, well, they'll try to pretend to be a species of firefly they're not, so that those other fireflies think they're a female of their species. And when those other males, a different species, try to come and mate with the female fatale, they get eaten. It eats them. That's the way for them to steal their chemicals. So it's tricking them. And the way that's confusing is because you might see a female glowing in a weird way and thinking that that's their normal glow. It isn't. It's the female mimicking another firefly. They're tricking the other fireflies. So in order to be sure that you have a species of photurus, you want to know what it is, that the reason that's why there are so few correct identifications is you have to follow them for a while. You have not to be distracted. Other things will come, other fireflies will show. You focus on a species of photurus, you go after it, you focus on one specimen. Don't allow it to be stressed. A stressed firefly will glow weirdly. Um, don't allow it to be tired. So check the temperature, humidity, those things. And if you see it in its optimal, normal mating behavior, you see how that pattern, flash pattern is, and that's how you get a good accurate identification. And that takes work and that's hard. So yes, it's, that's partially how, why we have so few species. There's a good chance, actually, I'm fairly certain uh, with a high level of certainty, we have quite a few species of firefly of Photurus genus that haven't yet been described for science right here in Indiana right now. We just haven't been able to disentangle that taxonomy. Uh, we have a few more questions. Uh, Scott and Ruth ask, uh, Sergio, were there family members, teachers, or others who sparked your fascination with insects in childhood? Um, I, I don't think there was anyone. I, I think the, be so the best answer or the true, most truthful answer, I didn't have anyone stop me. That was really how it came yeah. about. There was no one really into that. I, I'm, I'm a first generation scientist, as many scientists are, I think, these days. So I come from a from a humble family of farmers or generations of farmers uh, for like the last 500 years in Portugal. I'm Portuguese originally, but they all lived off the land, with the land. Um, and, you know, insects are just part of nature like anything else. So a lot of these preconceptions people have sometimes in urban environments, I didn't grow up with that. And as I developed interest in a number of things, I, I like flowers, I like mushrooms, I like, I don't know, trees, anything. I was just wasn't stopped. I was allowed to literally roam free. And as that did, it, the realization is quite sudden that if you're going to protect biodiversity, invertebrates is definitely the way to go. They're 90% of all species. If you're going to protect environment, it's hard to ignore insects. So it was more of a consequence of just being logical, really. Everyone should study insects. I'm surprised people don't. The answer should be, why don't they study insects? It should be just natural, in my view. Um. Uh, Carrie asks, in addition to factors like light pollution and disappearing wetlands, what predators threaten the survival of fireflies in Indiana? That's, that's a good question because it puts me a bit on the, well, first the threats and then the biology. So there's other threats. So water pollution is another one. There's a specific, there's a few pieces of firefly that I'm concerned about and I'm helping state governments to put those in their priority list as species of greater conservation concern. That's how it's phrased, and that's because of water pollution as well. So water quality is another issue. People sometimes in your own properties, in your own house, you get surrounded by mosquitoes. I get it, I don't like to be bitten either, it sucks. Um, but with that, 
sometimes the reaction is a bit, I would say, uh, over the top. And people just put chemicals hoping to kill mosquitoes. They ended up not killing the mosquitoes, but they will kill the fireflies. And they might kill a lot of other beneficial insects like ladybirds and you know, many other things. So sometimes this pollution that derives from you know, putting chemicals to kill mosquitoes, putting chemicals sometimes for agriculture. We do need food. So I'm not against protecting crops or having crops, but it should be done mindful. And that's another threat besides those. Um, the reason why predators aren't really a threat to fireflies is because I mentioned it a little in the life cycle. The glow is a warning to predators. The kind of idea I think that goes in nature is more along the lines of, if I can do this with the chemicals in my body, if I can produce light and afford to do it, imagine what else I can do with my body as well. And predators take that very seriously because that's a very expensive sign to have. So in, to, to honestly, so in biological terms and evolutionary terms, fireflies develop light to tell predators how toxic they are. That's why they developed it originally. So all larvae of fireflies, except for one weird species uh, that doesn't matter talking about, except for, I'll talk about it now. There's one species of firefly whose larva doesn't glow because it doesn't want to be detected in order to feed and attack, you know, and be more stealthier. But all other larvae of firefly do glow and they do it to avoid, you know, to avoid predators. That's where the larvae, some adult fireflies don't glow. All larvae do, but adults sometimes don't. And that's all chemical warnings. So not many animals eat them. Having said that, some of the animals that have overcome those chemical challenges are spiders. Spiders can eat fireflies very well. Uh, if you've ever been in the field, if you've seen webs, uh, uh, spiders are great at that. For them, a firefly is just a snack. They don't really care much. Fireflies have developed ways to avoid being trapped in webs. They don't spend too much time in the ground with ground spiders anyway. And there is no invasive spider that I know of that causes any problem. Um, and even the animals we have that are invasive or became, uh, let's say, feral, like cats. Cats are a big problem, uh, as many people should know, for birds, for wild birds. If you have a cat, if you allow it to go out, chances are your cat or the cat of your neighbor is killing birds and small amphibians and reptiles. So cats are a threat to a lot of native wildlife, feral cats, cats that are allowed to roam, but they're not a threat to fireflies. The cat might think of getting a firefly, it will regret it very soon. So it's not going to be a problem. Um, and yeah, so there's no predator that I know that is a, a conservation concern for fireflies in the big picture. Um, Bill just had a comment. Uh, he says, uh, we have, um, Bill's put me on the spot here with these Latin names, uh, Pyrectamina angulata in the Bernheim Forest, which is a really cool place in Kentucky. Nice. And he's uh, led some uh, public programs to view them. And he's also made a positive ID on wiggle dancers last night. Oh, well, good. We, it, well, the, se the season is right. So that, that's an awesome. I, I'm very happy. That's a, so as we get warmer, everyone here, if you're in Indiana, we're really at the start of the season. So we have the spring treetop fireflies. Those are often the first uh, ones to blow. That's Pyrocnomena. So Pyrocnomena is the genus of the Sace firefly. Pyrocnomena anglata being the Sace firefly. Pyrocnomena borealis, borealis as in the boreal lights, I guess, is the first one to come out. They have really interesting behavior and they emerged a few weeks ago, depending on where in the state. Indiana is quite interesting that its southern limit comes, things emerge much sooner, of course, than its northern Indiana dunes. So animals now actually, even though I just said that the spring tree drop is very active here in Indianapolis, very active in the south for quite a while, it's just now coming out in the north, just the first ones now. So, you know, there's a bit of a delay there. But yeah, if you live in the south, especially if you're close to Kentucky, uh, you know, close to, I don't know, even Southern Illinois, Southern Indiana, a lot of interesting stuff are coming out. I do get, I have like a small group on iNaturalist, which is fireflies of the Midwest. If you report any firefly on iNaturalist, I'll get a notification, I'll probably look at it. And, and I can kind of see these waves of species uh, and how they move from South to the North. Yes, yeah, Southern Indiana is great. Uh, and yeah, a lot of interesting things. Really happy to know that, they're really cool. Thank you for that. Yeah, I was watching last night in my apartment here in town. So. <laughs> Another question, uh, do fireflies in Indiana rely on any flowers for pollen or nectar in addition to eating snails and slugs? But that's a great question. So, so when I mention snails and slugs, I'll, I should make it a bit more clear that talking about the larvae, right? So when fireflies hatch from the egg, they're baby beetles, they're larvae, and that's when they're very predatorial. Uh, the Pyracnomena genus, so the group of the Sace firefly, the spring tree top, I just mentioned, all of them feed on snails. They have very long heads or necks, let's say they, they eat snails when they're larvae, as they pupate, like, you know, butterflies go into metamorphosis, they pupate and they become adults. So do fireflies. 
they do a little pupae, and then they become what we consider the actual firefly, the beetle. And in that stage, very few of them feed. And But having said that, uh, it's some of them might not feed at all, honestly. But having said that, some have been reported. There's a very interesting paper by Lynn Faust about fireflies feeding on milkweed. So it's known that some fireflies will do that. Some will feed on sap. So on, um, well, I, I also love uh, um, a, a maple syrup. So, so the fireflies and fireflies will go to the sap of maple trees sometimes. Some fire, usually the winter firefly will do that. And sometimes they even get caught in the sap. It's quite interesting. So they like sugary drinks. So of course, flowers is a thing, but I wouldn't consider them as pollinators because they don't thrive, they don't feed many. So a lot of them will not feed at all. And there's no connection to any specific flowers, even though, as I said, milkweed is known to be an attractant of some fireflies. But you have to take into account that that was the plant that was studied. Someone already looked at the plant and looked how many fireflies are coming. If I did that with a, a spice bush, or if I did that with a pop, you know, maybe you'll find it in other flowers as well. But it's quite, it's quite hard to have data on firefly behavior. So yeah, I would say they don't really do flowers. A, a little thing that I would add, just like a little snippet, if you ever want to keep fireflies in a jar as a child or your child wants to keep it, you should of course release them. But before you do, if you want to keep them healthy, put a little cloth with water in it, like a little damp piece of water from a tap. And if you want to be even nicer to a firefly, get an apple, an organic apple, better, because it doesn't have chemicals, cut the slice, and the fireflies will often go to the top of the sliced apple and try to drink the apple juice because it's sugary, it's sweet, and if it's organic, it doesn't have chemicals, it will be fine. So fireflies, even though in nature they never find a slice of apple, what's the chances in that? If you give it to them, they might take it. Uh, so that's just a little tip about their diet as well. Um, uh, Bill asked, uh, what's a good way to, to contact you, you know, with more maybe follow-up questions or, you know, just other firefly information? Sure. So, so my, my email is available on the, the Global Center webpage and Chris has my email. And, right. and so there's uh, some people at Sycamore. So that's easy. That's a good way. If you, if people have iNaturalist, if they, it, well, it's an app. If you don't know what iNaturalist is, it's an app you can download on your phone, allows you to record any species of wildlife, not just fireflies, it's flowers, trees, whatever you see and you wanna know what it is, that's a good chance. If you record the firefly in any of the Midwest states, I will see it. I, I, I might not know who you are or what, because I'm just, I'm looking at dozens of them a day, but chances are I'll keep an eye on it because I wanna keep that database clean. I wanna curate it so it's like, you know, accurate and keep the names up to date, all those boring things. So that's a good way. And I have, of course, an iNaturalist account. There's an email sort of message service in it. So I can be contacted there as well. And I have talked to people there. Could you, uh, I don't want to take too much of your time, but uh, could you maybe, uh, I feel it's it's relevant here to talk more about the Global Center, you know, tell us a little more about that, you know, since that's where you work and how it ended up at Indianapolis. We seem really fortunate to have it there, how you ended up there. Just, I mean, I don't, you don't have to tell us your whole life history, but. Sure. That's a little yeah, we're running a bit late, so I don't want to bore everyone as well. So, so the, the Indianapolis, so. The Global Center for Species Survival is global. I, I work with global invertebrates and we do conservation around the world, but it is based in Indiana. And the reason it's based in Indiana very shortly is because it's a partnership between the IUCN, which is International Union for the Conservation of Nature, uh, the Species Survival Commission of that um, union and the Indianapolis Zoo. So the Indianapolis Zoo is a co-partner in that in the Global Center. And as part of that partnership, it is where the Global Center is housed. So I'm physically housed, my office is at the Indianapolis Zoo. So that's where I work, that's where Indianapolis is where I am. And I mentioned before, that's how I got that connection to the Indiana State Insect. And that's how I ended up after working in London for 10 years, came here because the Global Center offered me a chance to, to so I was an academic, so I was working in like trends and models and that kind of stuff. But the fact remained from my experience, no matter how, how well, how good my models are, my programming is, we'll always see decline in biodiversity until we do something to stop it. And so the Global Center opened and I was fortunate that it did at the time it did. And the, the proposal was, if you wanna come and do and make a difference and come and change species trends, this is the place to be. So I traveled across the ocean and came here to do that. I left my academic career behind, stopped focusing so much on that side, science side of things. And I'm more driven now to work with Chris uh, and others around the world to actually change red lists 
uh, status to improving. We have a thing now calling the Saving the Species Challenge, which is a $1 million grant to for any project, including the, the, um, the Cypress Firefly, if Chris or someone else wants to come forward with that species to change its category from wherever it is to the next best one. So these are the kind of the reasons I came here. And that's what the center does. We try to change species conservation for the better. Well, let's see, does anyone else have any questions? I know it's it's, it's after eight now, but we um, really fascinating and we're lucky to have Sergio. So if anyone else has anything else, um, I have I have another question. We we like to I, I've helped host a few of these, and one question we like to ask people is, "What would you be doing if you weren't doing this?" What would I be doing? Well, today, uh, to be specific about today, I would probably be <laughs> putting my daughter to sleep and doing all of that. But more holistically, right? Overall, right. if I was if I wasn't doing this professionally, I would be doing this as an amateur because th this is what drives me anyway. And even though people think that I do this as a job and I kind of do this as a job, I get paid until like five. Nobody makes me go into the night after hours, after dinner to go and look for fireflies. I do it because I want to, because that's what it drives me to do it. It's not, it's part of my job, but it's not, you know, so I would be doing something like this. I had to, when I told my mom, when I went to uni and all of that, uh, she kind of knew, or because she's my mom, she kind of knew that I would do something like this. Even though I was trying to be serious and going to professorship and all of that things, she knew that sooner or later, that's not going to be the way I go because that's not who I am. I, I need, I thrive to be with people, to help them understand what's around them, to share knowledge. If I know something and I don't tell someone about it, that's a waste of knowledge. That, that's just lost information. Me knowing it is means nothing. The idea that someone else knows about it. So when I find something, I have that urge to share with others. And supposedly, or intention, that's the, the aim, I want to empower people to do something. I don't want just to share knowledge. I'll have that and be depressed. I want to people, I would like, I would hope people leave this talk and meeting me in every day, feel empowered that there's something you can do. You don't have to feel helpless. There, things are not great all the time, but if we fall into desperation, nothing will get better. Just take that energy that you feel it's a drive to do something and feel empowered to act. You can reduce your light pollution. You can reduce chemicals. You can convince your neighbors. Maybe not your neighbors if they're not nice people, but you can try and you can try the neighbors next door and the other ones and you can talk to land trust. Chris is a really cool guy to talk to. So, you know, you can always be involved in things. And I always get this kind of, well, you can see in my voice, I always get this drive. Don't feel desperate and helpless, do something. And if you fail, try again. And so I'm always happy to um, to try really hard, but failing really well. So if I do that, I'm already there. See folks, I told you, you, you would love this talk because he's so passionate. So, <laughs> uh, Well, I think that's a great way to end, even though I would love to go on all night, but uh, uh, I love the passion and, and the, the positive attitude about it. And, um, but yeah, uh, Sergio, thanks so much. Um, it was a wonderful, wonderful presentation. It's always great to talk to you. Um, I'm glad to see folks were engaged and, and tuned in, and I'm sure there'll be a lot of people watching the recording. So, you know, if you have friends that you're going to think, wow, they would have loved this, you know, we'll, we'll have, Kate will have the link out, you know, that you'll be able to share that with people so they can watch it. Um, you know, and it's, as he said, there's stuff we can do. Uh, we can all do stuff, not just for fireflies, for, for all things. Um, and you don't have to feel helpless. Um, so thank you, Sergio, and thanks yes. everyone for tuning in. And um, yeah, keep right. keep doing it. Yeah, see you next time, everyone. Thank you for joining. Thank you.